Oh, bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Thank you, Lord. Father, again, thank you for just this week that is set apart by your church to remember what we're called to abide in every day of every year. Your solution for fallen and broken humanity. Lord, we thank you for the divine plan which is Jesus. That he is your mystery revealed. He was your solution, hidden for the ages, made manifest this week, 2,000 years ago. Holy Spirit, help us to encounter the love of God made so vivid this week. the divine plan of death and resurrection in Christ. Show us that in a new way, personally. And specifically, Lord, I just ask that you would apply the victory of the cross to each of us, body, soul, and spirit. And to people in different parts of the world that you've given us stewardship over in the southeast and Africa that would have sovereign encounters. With the victorious risen Christ. Thank you again, Lord, that we're so um, vividly reminded that you provided a throne of grace as a result of this time in history. This week, your passion was revealed that we can come to again and again in our journey into Christ likeness for fresh cleansing. We bless you, Lord. Even now, as we confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess we have sinned against you and thought we indeed, in deed by what we've done, by what we've left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors ourselves. We're truly sorry. We humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you and forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you with all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. This is the holy gospel of our Lord, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. John chapter 12 and verse 9. <clears throat> When the word got out that Jesus was not far from Jerusalem, a large crowd came out to see him. And they also wanted to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. This prompted the chief priests to seal their plans to do away with both Jesus and Lazarus. For his miracle testimony was incontrovertible, 
and was persuading many of the Jews living in Jerusalem to believe in Jesus. The next day, the news that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem swept through the massive crowds gathered for the feast. So they took palm branches and went out to meet him. Everyone was shouting, Lord, be our Savior. Blessed is the one who <coughs> came, who comes to us, sent from Jehovah God, the King of Israel. Then Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it to fulfill what had been prophesied. People of Zion, have no fear. Look, it's your king riding to you on a young donkey. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I want really bad to teach on the donkey, but I'm going to say that for tonight at the broadcast that we do at 6, because technically that was yesterday. We wanted this week kind of just follow the events of Holy Week. I don't know why I want to talk about the donkey so much. Maybe it's because as an archbishop, I've encountered a lot of jackasses over the years. I think it's sorry. <laughs> and most of them were not among the laity, just in case you're wondering. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry about that. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is verse 11 of Mark 11. And he entered Jerusalem and came to the temple. This is on the same day of the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. And after looking all around, he departed for Bethany with the twelve since he was already late, since it was already late. And on the next day, when they had departed from Bethany, he became hungry. And seeing at a distance of fig tree and leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find, he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he answered and said to him, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to cast out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. The scene of that just amazes me. He didn't just turn tables over. Then he was running around stopping anybody trying to bring anything in. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer? For all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den. And the chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him. For all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. The two events that are recorded in the Gospels on Monday of Holy Week is the cursing of the fig tree and then the turning over of the tables in the temple. Um... There's a couple of things that I really, in my time with the Lord, God just connected. Some of them are some things I've said before. You can't do 4,000 Holy Weeks like I've done over the years. And, but, um, but they still minister a lot of life to me. But a dot that got connected uh, this morning in my time with the Lord really blessed me a lot. The first one is this. You've heard me talk about this before. That for years and years, I always thought it was really unfair to the fig tree that he would curse a fig tree that says it was out of season for producing figs. That just doesn't seem right. Now, I don't think the fig tree got its feelings hurt, but I don't know. A, a, a fruititarian might disagree with me about things like that. <laughs> that, that somehow Jesus committed murder. <sighs> hmm. 
But it says that. It says he went to it, found the, there was leaves. There was not, because it was not just leaves, because there was not the season for figs. I thought, well, it's just really unfair. Why would you, what is the point of doing this, cursing this fig tree, when nobody had a right to expect anything but leaves? Leaves come first, then the fruit come. And what the Lord spoke to me years ago, because he's teaching the disciples, he's always teaching them some things that's going to make a difference to them, especially after they've been filled with the Spirit, they're carrying his life, and they're going to continue to do what he's been doing in terms of preaching the gospel and manifesting the reality of the kingdom. And I believe that what he was trying to teach them is that he has the right to expect the impossible from something or someone who has no ability at all to produce it. Because <clears throat> he knew they were going to be confronted with many situations in the days to come and in the years to come. Like a person, um, like Peter and John and Peter and, and, and uh, chapter 3 of Acts, or the, all the ones who were healed in those situations, circumstances, and they're going to be placed into, that they were going to be faced with things that in their humanity, it was going to feel like it was a ridiculous situation and impossible, this circumstance that God's placed them in. And that he's requiring of them of something that is impossible. And he wanted them to understand that's the normal Christian life. He's always requiring of us what's impossible for us to produce apart from him. The Christian life isn't an easy life. The Christian life's not a hard life. Those of you who are going to go, yeah, no, it's not. It's really hard. I'm not giving in to your pity. The Christian life's impossible. There's only one person who can live the Christian life, and that's Jesus. And he made it impossible on purpose so you'd get it quickly, that you can't do it, that apart from him, you can do nothing. It counts eternally. And so I believe that he was teaching them that he has the right to place demands on us when he knows it's impossible for us to produce it. That's just normal. Make it very practical. I just don't know if I can stand him or her one more minute. <laughs> I just can't take it anymore. It wasn't about whether you can take it or stand it. If you're in union with Christ, Whatever he requires of you never seems unreasonable to him because whatever he requires of you, he's prepared to do through you. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. That's good news and bad news. The good news is you'll never face anything that he thinks is unreasonable because it's not impossible to him. The fact that it feels impossible to you is a gift because it reminds you to not try to just go ahead and handle it on your own. It reminds you you have to draw on him. That's good news. Bad news is you'll never have any more excuses. <laughs> but the connection to me, the Lord doesn't do anything arbitrarily. So he said before, when Jesus said, this is supposed to be a house of prayer, you've made it into a den of thieves, and that one of the ways a person's life becomes a den of thieves is they stop being a house of prayer. But I think specifically there's also a connection between these two stories. You know, when it says, after Jesus cleansed the temple and did all that he did, that the chief priests and the scribes heard this, and they began seeking to destroy him, for they were afraid of him. And for all the multitude were, was astonished at his teaching. Now, why were they so afraid? Why were they so upset about the temple thing? Is it because they were going to lose a lot of money? You're the ones who got all the money. Or was it they were 
terrified. The demons that were in them were terrified that that place would be restored to a house of prayer. No matter what these Pharisees' human motives were, the enemy was flourishing because the house of prayer had become a den of thieves. And it became a den of thieves because it stopped being a house of prayer. What's the connection? You know, there's a place, and I think it's Matthew 17, it's Mark 9, Matthew 17, where they come off the mountain and, um, and they discover that the disciples can't cast the demons out of this severely demon-possessed boy. And Jesus makes this statement. He says, why, they said, why couldn't we deal with it? He said, because of your little faith. In one scripture, the other place it says, because this kind only comes out by prayer. It doesn't say by prayer and fasting. The word fasting is an addition. By prayer. I used to get tickled when people when we say by prayer and fasting, or fasting can be a part of it, it's a part of our prayer life. Was Jesus saying like, if you come up to somebody and they're demon possessed, and it seems kind of tough, run off, pray and fast for three days and come back and do it. No. They didn't say like, well, sit here, let me chain you so you don't go anywhere and do any damage, I'm going to fast for a couple of days, then I'll be qualified and spiritual enough to deal with this. He's talking about a lifestyle. He said, because of your little faith, and what you do about little faith is you cultivate a lifestyle of intimacy. Because when you cultivate a lifestyle of intimacy, it births, it breeds confidence in him. And so I believe these are connected. Jesus is trying to teach them something. There are a lot of things happening here, but this is one of them, I believe. He teaches them that he has the right to demand of us things that seem impossible for us to produce. Because they are. Because the Christian life is supernatural. And he's the only one who can produce them through us. But the faith, the simple childlike faith that stewards that is cultivated in a place of intimacy. See, the enemy wants to rob us. Uh, the other, couple, about a week or so ago, I had my first dream with Olivia in the dream. I've had actually visions of Olivia in her resurrected state. It's been pretty cool. So there'll come a point where I get to talk about some of that. But I haven't had a dream. And I've had several people tell me that Livia's come to them in a dream. Now, Livia came to me in this dream, and she's admonishing me. I thought, well, this is no different than when she was here. I thought, what's the point? Um, <laughs> but, but in the dream, there were some things she was, it was really, I thought, I think, I, like I told somebody yesterday, I said, I think like, the Trinity said, okay, we can't get his attention, so we're sending her. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, I promise, I promise. I just speak softly. I'll get it next time. <laughs> uh, but it was really a God dream. It was a really powerful thing. And in the dream, what I realized was is that, and I've said this forever, if you want to go deeper, you got to become more simple. Um, Jesus said, unless you're converted and become like a little child. And what the enemy wants to do in our lives is to kill the childlikeness. Because it's the childlikeness, the childlike faith that that's doesn't give in to cynicism that will believe God for the impossible. If we're going to walk out the Christian life, personally, we're going to have to experience the impossible. If we're going to do the ministry God called us to, each and every one of us, not just David and Chris, as we go out in the streets, as we go to stores, the impossible. He has every right to demand of us the impossible, but we become more childlike in Abba's presence. And the enemy will do anything he can to stop that so that the house of prayer becomes a den of thieves. Instead of the childlike steward 
of the very presence of Christ who alone is able to produce the supernatural. I think those are the connections, at least one of them. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. But if you like donkeys and stories about donkeys, then tonight at 6, join us and we'll talk about donkeys. And if you want to know what was Olivia fussing me about, I ain't telling. <laughs> I'm disappointed that she found out in the first place. That God already ratted me out. The peace, Lord, be always with you. Always with you. Share the sign of God's peace with one another. A male's voice, so that at least at some this season of my life, I have a male telling me what to do. <laughs> all right. Bless you, Lord God, King of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which earth has given, human hands are made, become the body of Christ. Blessed be God forever. By the mixing of this water and this wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Bless you, Lord God, King of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine, and work of human hands will become the blood of Christ. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up, the Lord. Let us give thanks, Lord our God. We bless you. We praise you. Lord, that we sacramentally again enter into the holiest week of all where the apex of human history revolves around. But Lord, this week we enter into we don't just remember we enter into, once again, the stark reality that in Christ you made all things new. You unveiled your solution and answer for broken humanity. We praise you. Joining our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you're holy indeed, the fountain of all holiness. Let your Holy Spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy. May it become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before he was given up to death, a death he freely accepted, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup, and again he gave you thanks and praise. He gave the cup to his disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for the whole world, for the forgiveness of sins, for the healing of fallen and broken humanity. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Let us therefore proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, we thank you for the Alabama Awakening. We praise you for the Psalm Revival. We call it forth to full maturity, Lord, the river of glory you promised us to swim in. And in Jesus' name, we forbid the powers of darkness from in any way hindering, delaying, misrepresenting this move of God in Selma. We plead the victory of Christ over any disunity among spiritual leadership in our city. We ask you would gather together, Lord, anyone, anything that would stand in opposition to your purposes for Selma, would misrepresent your heart. But we ask you to change them. But Father, if they refuse to be changed, we ask you to remove them quickly from places of influence and impact. And you would raise up people, send new people from all over the world. We're people of revival with fresh wind and fresh fire. Sons and daughters of fresh oil. Draw our hearts from the poor and the broken to receive the body and the blood of Jesus that we be transformed to become the body of Christ in the world. Have mercy on us, O Lord. You have made us worthy to share eternal life with all the saints. That we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we're bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. You can be seated. Um, Michael, you got a word in you about the church? If you do, I want you to share it Sunday too, okay? But go ahead, because I think you do. I feel like I have a few things that I'm still kind of sorting out uh, in my heart, but... Um, still kind of sorting it out but um i mean the a big one is I, over len i've just kept hearing the lord say that i want to make you whole i want to make the church whole and um you know the things that you're good at the lord the lord has made you really good at but there's some other parts where uh maybe we're not as good at and um the problem is if we don't if it's kind of like a void in a pie, like, you know, someone ate this one slice of pie, and you're good at all these other things, but um, if we only focus on what we're not good at, then all those good things can become stale, and so um, the Lord wants to make you whole on that, and so I think really this week, just uh, the Lord wants you to press in on, Lord, like, where am I stagnant, where am I stale, and um, the Lord's going to really make you whole in that. Amen. Amen. I agree. 
<laughs> can, I, can I do an individual too, or is that? No, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Um, I just had, what was your name again? I met, I met you a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Chris. Chris, Chris. Um, when you walked in, I just saw um, kind of like, I, I had a, kind of a vision of a sponge, you know. When you, bu when you uh, buy a sponge, like, it's, that's the only time it's ever dry. Once you get that sponge wet, it seems like it never gets dry again. And the Lord just said that he's, um, he's filling that sponge up. He's making it as wet as possible. He's absorbing as much as possible in that sponge. And when he starts to wring it, he's going to wring every drop out of it. And that's what he's doing in, in you right now. And all you're doing when you're coming to Eucharist and when you're um, just seeking him on your own, He's just filling that sponge up with water. And then when he begins to ring you, he's going to ring you until there's nothing left to ring. Amen. Yes, ma'am. When I was sitting in the pew, uh, the Lord said to me to look in my mind's eye, look, what do you see? And I saw bison in my mind's eye. He said, they're really unusual, really exceptional, aren't they? They're, I said, yes, they really are. He says, but look over here. And what he was showing me was a young man kneeling before the cross, just totally boldly kneeling. And he said, those are the young men, he said, that I've called. Those are the young men that I know that I are bold for me just like John was willing to stand before the cross and all the others had run away. And so here today, I want to give that word to the young men here, David, Des, the man who's that back there with you, Michael and Michael and Chris. All of you, the Lord says, are bold men for him. Take heart because the courage that you have has been tested, will be tested, but you are called out to stand for him no matter what. And that great faith he loves, he has, he trusts in you and admires you for that faith. Go, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Go for it. Um, I have a word for you, Connie, and um, I see you find pennies all the time. And um, on every penny, it says, in God we trust. And I just feel like the Holy Spirit wants to remind you, trust him. And, and you know, I think that I don't know what the penny's deal is. But um, also, uh, uh, Chuck, I yeah. uh, heard oh, <laughs> Bishop Chuck, okay, too. Morning. This is a good word. You you might I like I stole it. your word, man. I don't ever get a word. It's, it's really good. I heard, the, I heard Benjamin Buttons. You ever heard of that? It's a movie about a guy that ages in reverse. And instead of getting older, he gets younger and younger. Uh, and I just feel like that's what the Lord is doing for you. Amen. I guess it's... There's a Dale and a Marlene that uh, the Lord is saying pretty much the same thing. It's coming around like the lazy Susan. It's coming back around again. It, uh, you think you missed it. But all that, it's not a restoration, it's a reclamation. The Lord is putting it up before you for you two to reclaim it. That's your harvest. Amen. Um, I kept hearing the word left and most of the time when I get that word I, it's, it's directional. It's like the person who works to the left of you, or it's been, it's sort of fun. But I heard the word left right, for you, and it's like the Lord said, "You've left something behind, and that's a good thing." Though it may not have been easy, but don't don't yearn for what's been left behind. Does that make sense? You know, maybe. Well, ask the Lord to show you. It could it could have been it could be anything that that been. It's kind of like when. Um, they left Egypt. They spent a lot of time wishing they were back there because they, they missed the leeks and the garlic and the fish and stuff. So sometimes it can be relationships. It can be other things we kind of regret or wish we had or whatever. The Lord said that it's a good thing because what you've left behind, you can't take with you into the destiny that God has for you. But I don't know, I don't know what it means. But 
which one it is. That applies. Okay, the Lord says, if you want the spirit of hilarity that the bishop has, you can have it. Everyone <laughs> thinks Holy Week has to be so solemn all the time, but the Lord Jesus showed me that he was kicking the can down the road with bishop. He kicks the can, bishop kicks the can, and they're going down the road together, and they're having a great time. And he says, we all know the reason for Holy Week is great joy, great joy, he said, the resurrection. So he said, yes, solemnity is one thing, but he says, you can come along with me and kick the can and have the spirit of hilarity. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> yep. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yes, solemn, except in a processional, it's not in my vocabulary. Um, I wasn't going to give a word, but I, I just kept coming back to maybe somebody with organ issues, and it may be someone on live I don't even know what organ, which organ it is, but... Um, words of knowledge, I think sometimes what I like about them is you may have settled for a certain condition, and when the Lord speaks a word of knowledge, what it does is it says, hey, I'm, we, we want to heal this. So if you're dealing with any issue whatsoever, we want to pray for you, but I specifically felt there is an organ issue. And then as soon as I got up here, Michael, I just feel like this, there's going to be a season where the artist in you is going to is going to come forth, and the Lord's going to give you a lot of creative ideas, um, and so we just bless you in Jesus' name. Okay. I, I, I got this picture. I know you're from California. You know, remember who Rick Barry was? Played for Golden State. And, and, but but this is really after after what uh, Rosemary said. This is for all you young guys. Rick Barry, I think, is still the NBA percentage leader in made free throws. And y'all, you know how guys in bat shoot their free throws like that. Barry did it. Like this, he took the ball from both spin that, and he was close to 100 percent. And so, for you young guys, man, that there's something there. You know, the world today expects men and young men to be a certain way, and y'all, that's not God's way. He's called you young men to stand up with that torch and say, God is on the throne, Jesus is living in me, and I'm going after him. That's what he's called you to do. Amen. Okay. It's a shame Rick Barry wasn't playing for Alabama last night, Michael. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you've taken away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you've taken away the sins of the world. Grant us your peace. Behold God's love for you. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those that are called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord, we praise you. These holy gifts. There is healing for body, soul, and spirit.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the divine power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who roam throughout some and the whole world, seeking the run of souls. And as we're entering into this holy week and wrapping up the ends of Lent, let us remember the gospel. That God was in Christ Jesus reconciling you and the world to himself, not counting yours or men's sins against them. God loves you. God has forgiven you. God is not angry with you. And God will never leave you nor forsake you. And now the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, come down on you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>